Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. Tatum flies away, pumps it in, 51 for Jason Tatum. The Big Three NBA podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Welcome to another edition of the Big Three NBA podcast. I'm your host, A. Shaw Blakely, and our guest today is Keith Pompey of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Keith covers the Philadelphia 76ers, the award winning Keith Pompey, uh, who covers the, the Philadelphia 76ers. What's going on, Keith? What's well, good? I forgot I won an award. <laughs> I know. I know. It's part, it's part of who you are, man. It's why, it's yeah. why you're here. We yeah. need we need big names. We need folks with talent. And that's certainly what you bring to the table. And speaking of talent, uh, Joel Embiid, uh, he's back. Sixers look way different um, since his return. They end the regular season winning eight in a row and unfortunately aren't, aren't able to get out of the playing game. Uh, but they may be matched up with maybe the best playing matchup that we've seen ever. Uh, going against the Miami Heat and, and keep just what's that what's the attitude mindset of the team to finish so strong and yet still not be able to kind of break through and get one of those top six spots you know it's weird because the one person if you want to talk about uh, the truth serum like of course everybody says hey this is okay you know da 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 but it was two guys who was truthful one of them was Nico Batum and he said this is tricky he said because you know we we did what we had to do and now all of a sudden we got to go and we're going to play against the Miami Heat, a team that made it to the championship from here. We got to win on Wednesday. Like we basically have to win. So he was being real. And then the second guy was Buddy Hill who said, you know, if you're the ninth and 10th team, see, you're kind of happy because you get a chance to get seven and eight. But if you're the other way, you may be a little disappointed that you got to play in the playing game after the success that we had. So, you know, right now they feel like their momentum can carry them. And they also did beat Miami the last time they played right in Miami. So they, you know, they feel that way, but like they also know that they had some tough battles with the heat and the heat does some things to them defensively that they have to be prepared for because they're not like beating their chest they know that this is going to be a tough matchup. Yeah, and it's 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 just so unusual to see two teams that historically have been really good, particularly this time of, well, Miami more so than Philadelphia this time of year, but the, this Sixers team is arguably playing the best basketball of the season at the right time to be playing that well. Uh, the, the, I'm curious, though, uh, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, one of the reasons why they've been able to get on this nice run of late it's been a play of Joel Embiid and, and just looking at his minutes, you know, he's played as few as 22 uh, since he came back and as many as 36. I think he played 36 against Detroit of all teams to play 36 minutes against. <laughs> uh, but it seems that his impact is, is undeniable and it seems like he's still kind of ratcheting himself back. And what are your impressions of, of Joel since he's been back? You know what? It's weird. Before he like when they played against uh, Orlando, he buckled his knee. Um, before that, I it, I looked at it like he's coming back. Like, he really looked good. You know, against Memphis, he had, like, 23, 23 minutes. He uh, he had 30 points in, in 23 minutes. And that's the stuff that Joel's been doing, you know, the regular season. So you looked at it. Um, the biggest impression, I think, is for what he does is he elevates everybody else on the floor. You know, if that, if that makes sense. It's kind of like. It's, it's tough for the guard, Tyrese Maxey. You know, Kelly Oubre is, is being aggressive, getting to the rim. You know, other guys are getting shots. Buddy Hield was starting to get shots that he normally hasn't gotten. And, you know, you look at Joel, you know, he he's still working through the uh, conditioning, but you can see his presence, like, elevate the team. It's also like they got more confidence. Like, it's kind of like when you're walking down the street with your tough dude, you got a buddy that y'all grew up together and the bully was on the end of the block. And now you can walk with your chest out, like knowing the bully ain't going to do anything. He's coming at you that's, today. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that, that's how it is when they got Joel and B. So that's the major impact that he's been able to make. And, and with, with that being said, though, uh, that Miami Heat uh, game, another big name across the aisle there in Bam out of bio. How does he normally fare against Bam? 
Oh, he normally gets the best of Bam because Bam is just too small for him. You know, like, you know, it's times where, you know, they'll, the before when they had bigger backup centers, they would try to do like the, the, the twins a couple sets and have another guy on and be, but Bam is um, just a little bit too small. You know, like you can look at Al, like Al Horford does a pretty good job against him. He's smaller than Embiid, but at the same time, I think Al is a more of a mature, more disciplined defender. So, but uh, Bam is the type of guy that he gets in foul trouble and he shoots over him and then he can um, back him down. It's, it's just a, is a weight and a height difference. So Bam typically struggles against him. And as, as much as we can go on and on about him beating his impact, he's not the sole reason why. Philadelphia's been on his, his run. Who are some of the other guys that have, have stood out just you know, as they made this really strong run to position themselves where they are in the postseason? You know, a lot of people are going to say Tyrese Maxey, right? And, and, I, and I'll say that. But the guy that really stood out the most, the one who's been the X factor, has been Kelly Oubre. Oubre? I mean, yeah, it's been Kelly Oubre. And it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, like a guy – who doesn't know his role. He wants a larger role. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you say, look, partner, you need to just relax, relax. But the fact that he wasn't willing to relax has benefited the Sixers. Like, you know, there's been times when he had better games than Tobias Harris. Right. So those are, he, he's really uh, lifted them up a lot to a point where, you know, there's certain people in Philly think that he's the third option, third best option. So I will say Kelly Oubre, has been the guy who's really elevated this team. And just the fact that he's even on the floor is, is impressive because, I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago. Where, I mean, folks weren't sure if this dude was, you know, even going to be able to get back out there and play, let alone play with a great impact. How, how has he been able to to do, you know, be a, a difference maker for them out there? What's he doing now that, that maybe he wasn't doing earlier this year or he's doing it more of now? It's, it's You know what, I, I think it's a little bit, a lot of it is he's bought in on the defensive end. Like here's a guy set six seven. He has a seven point two a seven foot two wingspan. And you know, Nick Nurse has got him to buy in to play in D. And there's been a couple games. One game he had five blocks, a couple games he had three, you know, a couple steals. And but I think the biggest thing on the offensive end is like he's realized that I have to stay active. Right. I know that Joel and Tyrese Maxey got that two man game going. So what I have to do is I got to crash the boards. I got to keep moving around. I have to do a lot of different things. And, you know, there was times that he didn't really like it. But but what he's also done was to help also help out his image. He's been a little flexible. Like, for instance, OK, Kelly, you're going to start at the two. Now, Kelly, I need you to come off the bench. Okay, Kelly, you're going to start at the three. So it's like he's been able to adjust to no matter what the Sixers have presented to him, where there's other players been kind of like cookie cutters, like they couldn't move outside the box, yeah. right? He's been able to adapt, and that's enabled him to excel and, and play at a high level. This is Sherrod Blakely with the Big 3 NBA Podcast, and I wanted to talk to you about Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports teams and players compete. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Get in now on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. Yes, just four picks can multiply your money big time. You can turn that $10 investment into a $1,000 win with basketball, hockey, and other sports entries today on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. As a longtime fantasy league player myself, Prize Picks is the perfect what's next to satisfy my fantasy league itch. You want into? Here's what you have to do. First, you got to go to prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's right. Prizepicks.com slash CLNS. 
and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. So, that being said, you get a chance to pick more, you can pick less, it's that easy. It's, it's surprising to hear that because that, that's, a, that's a definite sign of maturity, something I don't think we would have always associated with Kelly Oubre. Mm -hmm. You know, folks in Boston, they, they, their last memory of Kelly Oubre was him getting into it with Kelly Olenek uh, and, and just that whole kerfuffle. Uh, so Ke Kelly, but the thing about Kelly Oubre is the talent has never really been a question. It's just, can he deliver that and can he deliver it with some kind of consistency? Uh, and speaking of the opposite side of consistency, I want to talk to you about Tobias. Yeah. This guy who should be the number three. Uh, what's where, where does he stand now with, you know, his pe position in a pecking order? Because it just seems that when he first came there, it was like, okay, maybe he's your number two. Then Maxi took off. Okay, now he's your number three. And now Kelly is just like, at what point is the slide going to stop? Where, where is he going to finally establish his role in the hierarchy there yeah and that, that's a great question because you know like you said he should be number three i mean he should he should be number two right but but he should be no lower than number three um and and, and i i think that you know right about now it just seems like you know i i think and, and it's not a knock against tobias but i think part of the problem is you make so much money right you 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 like you, you, you know, you look at, you are one of the three stars, but they're not running plays for you. So at sometimes you could feel a certain way. Right. But what you have to do is, and he had success doing this early on was being aggressive, attacking the basket. Like you got to get out of the corner. Now, sometimes what they say is, well, that's where the coach told me to go. They want me in the corner. Yeah. But you got to get out when the ball goes up. You know what I mean? You have to move. So I, I feel like, you know, Tobias and is a tough spot for him because it's kind of like, OK, I'm the man. But now they got other people coming in and they give them they're giving them opportunities. Like so I, I think that's tough. But, yeah, you're right. He he has to really step up because, you know, and you know how it is in Philly. I mean, they hate Tobias Harris right about now. And I know they hate do. is a strong word, they but they do, man. Every day they bring up his salary. They bring up this and that. You know, uh, if you tweet something out nice about him, all they saying you work for the pop. You, you know what I mean? It's just, <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. But um, but the thing is, in order for, like you said, when is it going to slide? For them to get out of the second round, and maybe even the first round now because of the teams they got to play, they need – a, a major contribution from Tobias. And where that starts at, Tobias has to be aggressive. He yeah. has to be. And and for them to to obviously, you know, get through that whole playing round and, and get the best seeding possible, the best they can do is a seventh seed. And if they wind up seventh, then they got to play New York. Uh, if for some reason they, they still get out of that and wind up eighth, they play the Celtics. Who do they match up better with, uh, New York or, or, uh, or Boston? Man, I I, I want to say uh, that they're, they're both tough. They're both tough. The way I saw uh, New York boat race Boston last week, I would say <laughs> bring on Boston. But I felt like Boston wasn't really playing. Um, I would say New York because the thing about New York is as good as New York looks, and this not a knock against New York. The last couple of years, they've been more of a regular season team than a playoff team. The one time that they got out, of, the one time they had a little bit of success was when was when they beat Cleveland, who is in the same category. When you look at the Sixers in Boston, believe it or not, and these are two guys who have been injured for a long time. We got to think about this. Do you remember when the Sixers went to Boston in December and Joel didn't play, nor did uh, uh, Tyrese Maxey or Nico Batum? And they had Boston on the ropes. Mm -hmm. Tobias struggled, and that's how they lost the game. But what they had is they played with toughness. They had Robert Covington. They had DeAnthony Melton. They had Mook Morris. They had Pat Bev. Well, the problem is, is Robert Covington is hurt. He's probably he's done for the year. Uh, DeAnthony Melton is most likely done for the year. Patrick Beverly is going traded, and so is Mook Morris. So 
these are guys who provide toughness and defense. So when you go up against the Celtics, you know, like a guy like um, Jalen Brown, like you want to get physical with him. You want to do this. You always want to be on his hip. You want to prevent him from getting passes. Well, they don't have anybody that can do that right now in my eyes. And they're saying, and if they can't do that to him, what are they going to be able to do to Jason Tatum? So to when I look at the 76ers, you say to yourself, they're two, they got three guys. They got Nico Batum, who is a good guy, but I don't know if he can guard Tatum. Then you have Tobias, and then you also have Kelly Oubre. Like, I, I just don't see that the 76ers can stop them. And then I also think that Boston has the most underrated backcourt in the NBA, right? So then you pick Chris Tops out there, and he can stretch the floor. So that's do what does Joel do? Do I come out? And if I come out, everybody's going back door. So, you know what I mean? I just feel like right now, if I'm the 76ers, yo, this is a must win. And Nico Batum said that it's tricky because they will rather play the New York Knicks or whoever's number two than go to Boston and probably lose in five games. See, here's the thing. I, I think the, I think Nico's right. I mean, I, I think and not only is it a must win for them to get to the next round, I think it's a must win from the standpoint of laying the ground for work for what I think could be a trip to the Eastern Conference Finals. When you start looking at that side of the bracket, I mean, you're either going to play, if they get past Miami, which I expect them to do, then you're going to play New York, which a team with no Julius Randle, much more beatable. Uh, then if you could get past that round, then you're looking at either – either Milwaukee or Indiana. And mm -hmm. Milwaukee is is very beatable, very beatable. And Indiana, they ain't playing no defense. So all you got to do is be solid defense, solid offense, and defense is, is, is all right, and you're going to get past them. I see Boston and Philly in the conference finals. I honestly yeah. see. And, and Keith, you know me well enough. I am never going to be drinking a Kool-Aid of, of Sixers land. I'm That's what I was like. They can. They can. I mean, that's the thing. They just got to stay away from Boston, because if you look at Boston and you look at the Knicks, you know, the Knicks are trending up. But again, do you agree with me? Like they're the team that normally when the playoffs come, it's like, I don't know what it is. It's like the bright light. Yeah. yeah, they switch up. And you're like, no, you Randall. But you look at the other teams like like I, I don't know, man. Like, And, and I love Doc and, and, you know, great guy and all that. But you feel bad because you're looking at this and it's falling apart. And it's like the worst thing that they did was get rid of Drew Holiday, man. That was the worst thing that they did. So so then you look at that and then, like, you're right, Indiana. The thing about Indiana, Indiana used to run the six, like, up and down, up and down, up and down, get them tired. They did what Boston used to do to the Sixers, right, back in the day. But I don't know if – if they are a playoff team either. And I also don't know if that's going to work in the playoffs when teams slow it down. Right. So, yeah, they can get there, but it's just a matter. I hate to say it. The Sixers, the toughest two things that they had is going and playing Miami because we all know how Spo can coach, mm -hmm. right? Nick Nurse is a good coach too. But then you also have Jimmy Butler, Who's going to say y'all pick Tobias over me? He reminds everybody that, right? He's, he's still salty about that, man. Man, like I heard he was going to be salty until he retires over that. I, I think he's just using it to motivate himself by now. But then you have that. So then you have the Knicks. But to me, those are the two toughest tests until they get to the ball in Boston. Like I mean, they should get out of the second round if they get past the net. The Knicks, excuse me, the Knicks. So. We'll see. Yeah, I, I, I love the fact that th this the way that this thing is shaping up is that there's a game of interest at almost every stage of this, this postseason, even a play in. In fact, you know, that that Philly Miami game is probably going to be one of the most watched playing games ever because you're talking about two teams that if we're being honest and keeping it 100 probably shouldn't be in a playing game. Certainly Philly. though. I mean, the Joel injury, there's no I was talking to someone about this the other day. If you give Philly Five more games with Joel. Forget that. Give him like maybe three more games with Joel. They're probably a three, four, five seed. Yeah. Because uh, they're probably going to win those games because he's been that impactful. And to your point, 
other guys have stepped up. Other guys feeling good about themselves. They got big bro back now. They got big brother back there. So now they can, they feel like they can beat anybody. And they have done that uh, game in and game out. Uh, one person you mentioned that we haven't really talked much about, and I, and I, I think we, we would be remiss if we didn't get into it a little bit, is the head coach, Nick Nurse. I mean, Nick, I mean, I don't know how many coaches could have navigated their teams to this point when you, you're a guy that you lean on so much and Joel missed a significant time. And you don't have a, you don't, there's not like there's a one B. I mean, it's like Joel and it's a big ass drop off for the next best player to be able to still get to the postseason and be playing as well as they are. Talk about what Nick Nurse has been able to do. Well, he's done a lot, man. And, and the thing about it is, you know, you know, I, I I had to call people from Toronto and ask them questions about him because he's he switches it up a lot. And they said that's what he does in the regular season, but he's always thinking ahead to the playoffs. So when you talk about Nick Nurse, right, you got to go back from the beginning. When James Harden was there, James Harden refused to play, right? They go to the first player, the play of the first game. He's trying to sneak onto the team playing. Then all of a sudden they're like, nah. And then they trade them, and then they bring in all these dudes who was basically riding the bench for the Clippers. And then next thing you know, they play Boston, and we're like, whoa, they may be pretty good. Yeah. I mean, this team may be really good. Yeah. So you look at it, and then you lose Joel. I mean, the things that Nick Nurse has been able to do, I'll say he's adjusted and adapted on the fly. Like, when everybody thought that they were going to take a step back, Next thing you know, like they 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 look relevant early on. He got all these new guys in who, let's be real, was sitting the bench for the Clippers, and he made them all like valuable role players for the Sixers. And then Joel gets hurt; they struggle, and now all of a sudden they're back. But before Joel got hurt, the Sixers, in my opinion, was the second best team in the East. They were like a half a game away from Milwaukee. But you were looking forward to them yeah. playing Milwaukee because you knew they was going to get them. Like, yeah. you you knew they were going to get them. So, you're right. If they would have played five more games, they they would have been they would have been fine. But yeah. the thing is, the one thing I will say about this Sixers team, though, and, 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 and Sherrod, you the same way, it's kind of like I feel like they did lose some toughness, though. I mean, I think they lost two grimy dudes. Now, I – I love what Kyle Lowry brings, but Marcus Morris, Mook Morris, and um, Pat Bev, like, they lost two grimy dudes, man. And 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 I think you need that in the playoff run because you got to get in people's heads. Yeah, you do. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, pretty much every team that wins a championship has one or two of those guys that are just – that's literally their specialty. It is grind. Uh, and that's one of the qu concerns and questions about the Celtics, whether they got enough grinders. I, I know that when they have played, you know, teams like Milwaukee and, and, and your boy Pat Bev, like, tries to get in the face of Peyton Pritchard, Peyton Pritchard don't back down. I was just like, wait, what, what? And, I mean, like, literally getting it. And that's the kind of stuff that you just don't see. The playoffs have a tendency to bring that out. If you got some dog in you, the playoffs will bring that dog out of you. Uh, and I, as we kind of go through this whole process of the postseason and – I still believe in my heart of hearts that it's going to be Boston and Philly in the conference finals. And if that comes to be, if that comes to be, Boston obviously is going to be the heavy favorite just because of the record and seating and all that. But what's the path that Philly could potentially take if they were to get that far and Boston was waiting to emerge victorious? What would Philly have to do? How, what does that look like, a Philly upset? Wow, that would be tough. I, I think that uh, we would have to see. Ooh, I, I think Tobias Harris is going to have to have a big series. I do. I mean, I'm not really big in that way, but in a sense, he's going to have to make some shots step up. Because when you look at it, you know, like you, you like Kelly going to have to do something too. But, but, but I, I think Tobias is going to have to have a phenomenal, some phenomenal games because you know you look at it. Right now, Tobias is the guy that has to cover Jason Tatum. And that's a tough – That's a. I mean, think about that. Damn. And Tatum has been, like, getting the best of them, right? So Damn. that's what I'm saying, dude. Like, you need Tobias to really step up. You also need Buddy Hill to make shots. Yeah. You need him to stretch that floor. Because the thing about it is the last four games, Buddy has found his groove. 
He shot uh, 46.3% from the three his last four games. But before that, man, he started out with two solid games. After that, I was like, yo, that's who they traded for? Like, you know what I mean? Brother was struggling. So it's kind of like I think Tobias has to play well and Buddy Hill has to knock down shots because his knocking down shots is going to basically um, open things up for Embiid and Maxi to, to move maneuver a little bit. So that so that's what it is. That's what it is. And I hate to say this, man. Like the one thing about the Celtics, if and and I like Joe Mazzullo, nice dude and all that, but I think his inexperience is if I'm the Sixers and if I'm Nick Nurse, I'm going to try to exploit that as much as possible, doing trick crazy things, getting guys out of whack, trying to confuse them, and hoping and praying that a second year coach isn't going to be able to figure out what I'm doing or figure out a way to stop it. Yeah, that's a, I mean that that that's what I would do if I were Nick Nurse. Uh, Joe is I mean Joe's done a good job this year, obviously. Uh, but as we know, the playoffs are a different animal for players and for coaches. Uh, whatever your weaknesses are, they're going to be their you know, opponent is going to try to exploit them. Whatever your strengths are, they're going to try to tamper those down. So uh, that will be an an interesting you know uh, cat and mouse game between Joe and Nick if we get to that point, which I think we will. I, I'm I'm looking. I've I've gone up and down, back and forth, inside out, and if Philly can get past Miami, I I don't see any of the teams that will be in their way keeping them from getting to the conference finals. Because the thing I always come back to, Keith, is this: Can you beat this team four times? When I'm thinking about teams that I'm, I'm, I expect to go through, and I don't think, I don't think Milwaukee can beat them four times. I don't think Indiana can beat them four times. Uh, and, and because of that, they should, they should automatically go into the next round. Uh, so, but we will find out in due time. In due time, my friend, the Miami Heat uh, and the Philadelphia 76ers play on Wednesday night. Uh, the winner moves on to be the number seven seed, where they will play the New York Knicks in the best of seven. Uh, Knicks most likely will be favored against both of those teams. I don't care. I still got Philly, uh, which is crazy coming from these lips because these lips almost never got Philly unless we talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. That's why Keith is tripping like, wait a minute, what the hell happened to Sherrod? But, I know, right? I know, right? I'm, I'm, I'm believing in this team and shit, though, man. I, I like what I see. I, I like what I see. Um, and that, my friends, is all we got today. Uh, Keith, thank you for coming on the Big 3 NBA podcast here. Uh, and again, looking forward to seeing you down the road. Hopefully see you in the conference finals. Uh, and uh, that's it. We've got all the time today. But folks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks for our guest, Keith Pompey, for being here. And we will see you later.